Okay, so I'd like to call the meeting to order at 7.03 p.m. Can I have a second? Second, sorry. Second. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, we're going to go through the agenda as published. First thing we need to uh, decide is you've all seen the minutes. I sent them around and I'd like to see if we all approve of those minutes as written. So moved. Second. Great. Okay, I'll send those to the town clerk tonight. Um, I'd like to also welcome, we have a few guests tonight. Mary Hartman is officially our select board uh, liaison for this next year. So welcome, Mary. Thank you. And we also have another guest, Donna, and a student, I think I saw Tess from the middle school who are wanting to join our meeting and find out what White Pond Advisory Committee does. So welcome. And then Cheryl, anybody else who comes, you'll see for the attendees. Yeah. Usually there's more people, but we have a small house tonight. Yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah. Um, so thank you, everybody. Um, the first thing we're gonna do is review the outstanding action items from the meeting before. My, I had an action item to contact Carrie LaFleur, the town manager, to ask for the beach project contact now that Kate Hodges is gone. Um, Carrie got right back to me and let me know that Gail Dowd is now the person we can address all questions to. It's D-O-W-D, Cheryl. D-O-W-D, okay. Yeah, and I think she's actually in the finance department too. She's, I'm sure, Mary, yeah. you may know, but she may be the yeah. temporary or the head of finance now that Carrie's the interim town manager. She's an interim finance person, yes. Great, so um, I then, so she's in charge the, of the whole beach project going forward. Yeah, well, she's not in charge, but she's going to be the person who will get answers to any questions our committee or BFRT or anybody else has. Okay, gotcha. Okay. And so that's who then I contacted for our action items. The first one was a question that might have been from uh, Maria, who I see was on the phone. I'm not sure if she still is. Um, that it seemed like construction had stopped the week we were on our last call. And uh, Gail answered immediately and said that there was a few items that caused the work to be uh, paused. April vacation, and they were finishing up the boardwalk in another project. So it wasn't that it was stopped. The goal still is to have it finished by May 31st um, in its entirety. So I think they're working daily now. Another attendee had concerns about the plantings and the contours about the newly installed plants and to see if water would be retained or it was not going to, you know, they were worried about the survival of the plants. And Gail answered that the grade around all of the new plantings will be brought up to two to four inches with loam. If the plants were buried deeper, the loam would cover the lower portion of the trunk, which would eventually suffocate and rot out the planting. So they were aware that some had little dips and you know circles around them, but that was done on purpose. And I don't know, I haven't gone there, I've been out of town working for the past week if they've already put the loam up there, but I'm assuming it has to be because we have another week before you know the project's over. Any questions on that? They've also uh, put some more bags around the trees. Bags too? Okay, good. At least the ones that I can see. Yeah, okay, good. And then Jim had an action item to resend the email he previously sent to the rec department requesting that the gate at, at the top of the uh, parking be closed. And I wanna be clear, there's two gates. There's one gate that opens up the entire area. One goes to where the Fisher and handicap access is. And then the other was for the beach parking lot. And so that was the action item Jim was following up on. I saw the email, Jim, if you wanna give a summary yeah, of what happened. Um, rather than, um, I didn't state a position that we want it blocked after hours um, because as a group, we don't have a consensus on that. And I felt uh, to push it that way and then find out that we have differing opinions on the committee didn't make a lot of sense. So my feeling is we need to agree that we want it locked and uh, then go ahead and press that as a, you know, push for it hard. Right, so just as a reminder, we did add that as something we that was desired in the vision, which yes. is posted on, uh, you know, the White Pond Advisory Committee as part of the Concord website. So that is something that we, I think, had come to consensus on. Yeah, so right. we had, but I know the last discussion, um, 
uh, I had just Carol and I, I had different observations. I just mentioned Jim that I was there, and I and frankly I yeah. didn't see a lot of activity there. I, I just threw that in, but I wasn't disagreeing okay. with the, the committee's position well, that no, that was. You're, you're certainly uh, entitled to you know your views. That's why I um, didn't push it, but I, we should now go ahead. I think and. Uh, I can write that if you'd like. Well, I think this is where um, Mary, as our liaison, can bring our, you know, our committee advice to the select board about that, um, because we felt that, especially after the lifeguards leave and it's, you know, closed for the night, that's where some of the, you know, some, we've had some, a lot of activity, especially the summer before last when the height of COVID, where, you know, large groups of people were there congregating, swimming, music, et cetera. So that was why we felt that one portion should be closed after hours. I can no, bring that up. Sorry. No, go ahead. I can bring that up to the town manager. I don't think this is something that the select board will, will discuss. Oh, okay. I thought that was the, the, <laughs> the process that we did because the vision was actually presented to the select board, but thank you. Whatever is the best way to do that, Mary. We right. appreciate it. Well, well, the vision was selected, was presented to the select board as an advisory document. That doesn't mean that the select board adopted every one of the requests. Oh yeah, no, I mean, it was presented to you. And then is that how it goes? You'll just ask the town manager or tell I can do that or you can ask her yourself. It's up to you. I mean, if, if I, I don't- think whatever, whatever is the, you know, the fastest, maybe you see or talk with her more often than us. I do. Okay, good. If you would, um, you know, that's what the committee has suggested would be ideal. Thank you so much. Okay. And thanks, you know, Jim, Beth, for contacting. One of the, one of the issues for um, something like controlling the parking lot at night and uh, the parking permit program, for example, is they work very well. So people now will say, well, what's the problem? You know, why do we need these things? Well, I think we saw just this spring that uh, uh, before the roads were, you know, patrolled and posted, we had visitors parking in neighbors' driveways and so forth. It just happens so quickly. So to me, it's preventive and we need to continue it. Um, that's why I feel strongly about it because without it, I mean, you know, I can remember every night you'd wake up with shrieks at two and 3 a.m. from, you know, kids using the pond, which is understandable. But uh, I think opening that lot just, uh, offers the opportunity for all sorts of stuff that we don't want going on. Okay. Just to be yeah. clear, this is the lot at the top. When you drive in and you go to the left, that yes. lot right at yes. the top. That right now is not not paved. It's a construction site right now. No, it's paved, but I guess they plan to repave it after the work is done. I was there today but, and it's not paved. That upper lot? Yeah. Well, they Unless they unpaved it because it was paved yesterday <laughs> well yeah. there's a lot of dirt around there and there's a oh, lot yeah. of granite granite um mark i guess granite things for well, the that's where they're storing their materials they're it, a lot of stuff. A lot. so where where are people supposed to park well it's, it's closed open during, right now it's open during uh you know from dawn to dusk and it's supposedly for members of the beach Okay, Beth, I'm sorry. Can I continue this or do you want to just move on? I've got a, a question. I've got questions. So when people go in, where exactly do they park? Because it's, it's, I don't see how it's open right now for a lot of parking. It, it's not open right now for parking. It's closed. And in fact, I think they put up a gate at night right now because it's, right. it's being used for storing material right now. Um, right. There's all sorts of stuff there. I, I live right next door to it. Um, yeah, I think they mean after it's completed, that's when they want to, uh, the committee's position is that after it's completed and the beach is open or once all that material yeah. is moved, then it's time to think about, you know, closing the gates. Not now because okay. it is a construction site right now. Absolutely. It is a construction site. And I don't think it's going to be done by the end of May, which is what I thought I heard. It's, it's, I mean, what is today? Today's the 25th, right? I think it's unlikely that it's going to be yeah. done by the end of May. And actually, the, the director of recreation told uh, the town manager that the beach wouldn't open until June 20th. Right. So I don't. These but I think are, that's these that's are a, 
Yeah, I think the beach is opening in June. It doesn't open at the end of May. It's just that we were told in earlier, a couple of weeks ago, they confirmed May 31st. So obviously with construction, things can change. But we're, Mary, just so we're all clear, we're talking about yeah. once it's done, Got it. we'd like that upper gate closed. Okay, yeah. fine. But I got not, it. The part, not the access to the Fisher people. No. You know, there's two. The two road that goes go straight down. down. I understand. Yeah. Okay, okay, good. Great. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, so thanks, Jim, for following up on that too. Um, the next item on the agenda is to review the B, the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail planned fencing. There was a trail walk on May 5th to review the fence openings and uh, Josh was able to do the walk with the BFR team members. I think Delia Kay was there as well. Um, Delia wanted to keep the five foot gap in the fence to preserve trail access and um, others, including members of our committee and you know people we've heard from want it closed because it's a real sure way access to get into the pond. We just feel into it, the stations area as well. So it's something we have to discuss how strongly we feel. Also the, um, the stone root, you know, they have a, a land trust that they have access and they have also been involved and have been sending emails with uh, in between with Marsha Rasmussen. I'm not sure if she's still here or not. And that's the old Picard Trust. So they also want to, as far as I was told, keep um, access limited. So their area, their beach access is not, you know, entered into because I don't know if there's any liability issues or whatever, but they like to keep it um, fenced as well. So I think our but committee- they want the gap, they want that gap closed as well. Yeah, yeah. So we have to decide just like this upper gate, is it something we feel strongly enough or we can put it as an action item to discuss next meeting when we're all here? Um, because obviously I don't think the fence is gonna happen in the next month, but we have to decide if we wanna make a statement or position on this. So I don't know if Cheryl or Jim, you have any anything to add or? Well, my concern is uh, we have two major events occurring that are gonna have a big impact on the pond. And one is um, Bruce Freeman Rail Trail. And the committee that's working on it says we're gonna see thousands of people during the course of a summer, perhaps, at least that's their projection. The other one is the 400 residential units at um, uh, the, the property on Route 117 in the old um, gravel pit. Uh, they have direct access to trails to the pond as well. And um, that's one of their marketing pitches that uh, all those trails are available. So I, I think it's broader than just the gap in the fence. I think that's a step. Um, but are we prepared to handle all these people that we're inviting in? Um, it could be a real mess if we aren't well prepared to deal with it, whatever the decision is about it being open or not. That's, that's right. my concern. I think it's a broader you know, I've, I've heard that the town's position at one point was, so let's see what the problems are, then we'll deal with it. Um, I think we can come halfway at least and anticipate certain problems and figure out the steps that need to be taken. Right. I mean, that's obviously, you know, the Ranger program, and I haven't heard an update if Rangers have been hired. One of their roles was to, you know, kind of keep the cove area yeah. uh, safe. You can see through the last couple of weeks that clearly people were swimming, dogs were in the water at the cove because I have a direct view there. Um, the beach, people were using the beach. Clearly no swimming signs are there, but it's, they're not being, they're not obviously uh, being enforced in any way. But this section of the fence is directly behind, you know, kind of where the rail trail for, is going into Sudbury. And so yeah. that's this one section for sure is something we're discussing. Um, Maria, do you have a comment on that? I see your hand oh, is up. Hi. Yes, I met, went to that meeting and my takeaway was that there would be an opening, uh, it would be a small one they said, but there would be an opening, no gate along the, um, from the, from the bike, bike trail towards our um, White Pond area. It sounded like you were saying there was no opening, but there is an opening. No, 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 sorry. I'm talking about the walkthrough they did May 5th. Did you attend that? Yes. So Josh was there and he indicated, and it's in the agenda in the kind of a, he gave a little summary that Delia wanted to keep it open 
yes. and the 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 trust is still wanting to gather information. And my point is, if we feel as a committee that we don't want it open, we need to be clear in what our recommendations are. Nothing's been decided. Okay. Is there There's any, no? Go ahead. Is there any um, rule that it, there has to be an opening, or can it be completely closed? There's no rule, as far as we know. Okay. And so, the fence that's there is a three rail fence. It's just a rail fence. Right. The one that goes along the that was put in by the new stairs. Well, now they're three years old for the erosion control. Right. Right. It's just well, basically a barrier to protect you from this sharp drop off. And that's yeah. So, yeah. Like there will be a fence. So where you come in from White Ave, if you're familiar from that area, you know, underneath, uh -huh. you're going to go underneath the viaduct and then there's a trail from the White Ave. There's a White Ave beach and then there's the Stone Root beach further down. Um, they would, right in front of that, there's a vernal pond. The, that fence will be extended there because of the drop. And right. then in certain areas, like you said, because of the drop. But I think it was the committee in our vision, we thought it's better to have a fence just because it shows a signal, uh, similar to Jim's point, at least says it's like you're attempting, not that it will do everything. But right now, many of us have seen, you know, the bikes go in there, people were ripping down those temporary laminated signs because they don't want people riding their bikes in there. They do want dogs leashed, et cetera. But we just thought it was a really easy access point. And at least it would maybe prevent a lot of access. But Jim, to your point, on the other side, going around from where the Quarry North, whatever that's called, you know, there's tons of trails from that area and from Frost Farm. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's such a beautiful area. You don't want to shut people out. At the same time, if we're inviting them in, how are we going to keep it in reasonable, natural shape? Um, you know, and it's I'd not like shutting to, them out because the rail trail would still be there, right? It's just shutting yeah. out certain igris or whatever you want to call yeah. certain points. Yeah. I mean, I would like to, um, you know, Delia's point is well taken. Um, those are essentially her trails. Um, but what is the plan in case they're just, we have a mess, you know? Yeah. Cheryl, I mean, do you have any thoughts or any other comments to add? Yeah, I mean, I guess I would really push to your point, Jim, and say, fine, if you really feel like the trail has to be open and there are other access, put a plan in place now and not wait. Because we know yeah. it, without all these other things that have shown up, the new development, the new rail trail, people are already accessing this property by all sorts of means. And we already can't handle it, which we've demonstrated previously. So um, we have the evidence that people are going to access it and use it and swim and not take the, keep their dogs out. So we should, there should be a plan in place ahead of time. I agree with you, Jim. At a minimum, we should be pushing for that. You know, okay. the, the way I view it too is it's not, we're trying to, um, you know, man, totally manage the head count, um, which is hard to do. Um, but the pond is at a tipping point and there are several steps that need to be taken to prevent it from being, you know, irretrievable. I was talking with uh, Melanie, the new um, health board director, and she came from, I think it was Wakefield. Popular lake there, uh, public swimming and so forth has been closed permanently. They just got it written off as unsalvageable. Um, you know, we're certainly not there, we're far from it, but let's do whatever we can never to get there. Okay, so what I'm hearing is at a minimum, we would like a plan if there is openings throughout what will be done, will there be anything to prevent people from, I mean, going in the pond? Um, so we can ask that question. I don't know if that's a question we asked to Delia and then we can discuss yeah. it again next month. Yeah, no, I think that's a good place to start with her. Okay. She kind of has the oversight of it. Okay. All right. Could I just add I mean, when you? I just want to give you the gist from the meeting. I might have been the only per person who attended that's in this group when we met with Delia at the trail. Um, yeah, Josh. Sorry, Mary. Josh went and he'd given us notes. But go ahead. Okay. Just when the the last thing that was said basically was when everybody was talking to Delia was that she would keep the opening as small as possible, 
um, not a big opening, but small as possible. But there was an opening and everybody there seemed to agree to that. It wasn't as if anyone said, no, we don't want any opening. So when you go forward, I want you to know what was said, that's all. Yeah, okay. and so all I can do is read the co-chair, my co-chair, our co-chair, Josh, he wrote that the OTPI, that's the Pickard Trust Fund people, say that they attended, they intended to gather information and will provide an opinion on that at a later time. As right. far as I know, they have not garnered an opinion yet. And he did write that Dilly wishes to keep the five foot gap, not a smaller gap. So you're saying it was a smaller <laughs> gap. Yeah, she said it could be, but there would be, there would be a, an opening. There would be an opening. Okay. And it would be as far as possible. When you're standing there, you can see where the trees begin and the ground rises up. So that the fence would go all the way to where it can no longer be a fence because there are trees in the way. And that's where the gap would be farthest away from the pond. And it would be, you know, smaller, not all big so that, and that was done because people didn't want someone who's riding their bike down the, the trail to just veer right in and ride right into the uh, White Pond Reservation. And so by keeping it small, they'd have to hopefully get off their bike and then there would be a, a place to lock the bikes, I believe, um, and then they could walk in. So it discouraged people from riding the bike and that's why it was made smaller. That's what I remember. So you get the whole picture. Okay, thank you. All right, we're gonna move on. Um, subcommittee reports. So I can handle the testing and water quality. If you don't know this already, the APOD went in the water Friday, May 20th. It was put in Thoreau Cove area. It extended pretty far out. And uh, just this week, it was pushed a little closer into the, the shore. So the APOD's in, in operation now. Um, water testing also has begun, the water quality testing from Nancy Leland and from the University of New Hampshire. And uh, Melanie Deneen, who's the new board of health director and Gabby White, Gabby actually did a lot of work to create a website. It's going to be called the White Pond Watershed. And I don't know if it's active now, but we'll, we'll put it you know, in our minutes when I get the exact web address and we can put it on the Facebook page and let friends of White Pond know as well. That's gonna be the communication to let people in town know if there's a bloom and they're going to have a color coded, like green means it's okay, yellow is a caution, so you wouldn't want your animals or you know small children nearby. And then red of course means no. The water testing is in two deep sites. Um, and this, the, the testing that's being done just so people are clear, it's not <clears throat> right now cyanobacteria testing. It's indicators, different indicators they'll test that will let us know if things are uh, creeping in a direction that would be unhealthy. And when that starts going on, the testing will be increased from every other week to weekly. And then because of the cost of the actual cyanobacteria test, then that's when they'll finally deploy that test itself. But the water quality testing will be indicative of everything that's happening. So that's great news, it started and yeah. reports will be on the website. So it's actually pretty nifty. It's got an area to report blooms. I saw the, the sandbox or the test area and I think it's gonna be very helpful. The only question I still had to Melanie and Gabby was would they put the actual data on the town website? People like myself and maybe you who are you know science-based would like to see that. So I'm waiting for an answer on that. Additionally, I can tell you that we asked the select board to send another letter to Fish and Game because they had not responded as of yet to our letter, not just stocked with uh, you know, rainbow trout. But I think because of the, the top gate being closed, we got lucky because they couldn't stock when everybody else was stocked at end of March. Like for instance, Walden Pond was stocked with rainbow. We were not and the website said coming soon. So recently, May 5th, I checked fish and game and we were stocked with lake trout and I think brown trout, no rainbow. So that's actually really good news because now we mm, have you know, the is. possibility for the zooplankton to, to grow without being consumed by the rainbow trout. And we have the APOD working and we have the water testing. So whether fish and game did that on purpose because of our letter or it just happened <laughs> that they couldn't get in, not sure. 
we, I, my recollection is though, at one point that was, um, th what they wrote on their site was not actually what happened. Um, so I'm not sure how accurate their site was. So I remember several years ago, some information went on and then somebody in the White Pond neighborhood here went and actually checked with them and they said, no, 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 we put in white, we put in rainbow trout. That's not true. So we what, should keep that in mind that their whatever yeah. on the website, <laughs> their website was not accurate. Well, uh, it was accurate. It, it was accurate, Cheryl, just a little correction there. It was accurate, except that when um, we looked at the March stocking, they hadn't put rainbow in yet. They had put in another species and then two weeks later rainbow were added or three. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I so, just remember that there was something that yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'm not saying this could happen again, you know, it could happen in June that they stock. So that was another reason. And maybe Mary, this is um when a, a select board question because I had emailed Terry Ackerman and asked if we could ask them for a response because we didn't get a response this time. So it would still be nice to see what their intentions are. You know, Beth, I think, um, uh, I think the town has been very thoughtful of how it's approached this, but I think we're working at the wrong level. Uh, and I think this is a time where we need to get our Senator and rep involved and go to the cabinet level person. Um, and unfortunately she just re resigned her role that this department falls under. But, you know, the folks who are running the fishery program and recreational programs and managing the licenses, um, they have one outlook on this. Um, and generally that's to do the best job they can with producing fish, uh, seeing that the licensees are getting what they bargained for. And they're gonna be resistant to change. Whereas I think somebody at a higher level is gonna say, well, you know, we have to balance what we're doing there. So this doesn't seem like a major issue, even though it's a nice game fish. Um, right. We I just did, think it needs to go up. We did. Um, so for everybody who's new here, we did have, I, I went to a select board meeting myself and we, I asked Senator Barrett to, if he could get involved and Senator Barrett sent a letter. Okay. Fish and Game actually responded to that saying they had sent the town a response and the town somehow it had gotten lost. Stephen uh, Crane found yeah. the letter like a year later. Yeah. So when I sent the email to Terry recently in the past month asking to resend our letter and copy Senator Barrett again, because I agree with you, it, it somehow went with him being involved, yeah. you know, we yeah. got answers. So I did ask yeah. specifically that he be copied and, you know, kind of be like, this is our second request. We haven't seen, you know, we haven't seen your response. So at least we get it in writing if they plan to do this or not, yeah, right? Yeah. Because the first time they responded, we we you know we we didn't have the information from that Trophic Lakes cascading paper. There was new data, and so we responded saying there's new data indicating that rainbow trout are a potential, and we're doing all sorts of things here to mitigate any kind of potential you know things that yeah. could help. So I think it'd be really good if we can get a response from them. So Mary, uh, hopefully if you can. Yep, I got um, that, I got it. Thank you, great, thanks so much. Um, the second one was the, you know, we talked, we had Alan Cathcart, excellent uh, discussion last month with Alan. He's full of information, good information. And it was about the feasibility. So he, he suggested a feasibility study be done for sewer and septic stormwater drainage uh, as opposed to, and he said it would be a long-term effort if we wanted to ever, you know, move forward with this. And I know, um, I think Jim, you might have a little update on that as well. Yeah, yeah, I do. I, I kind of try to uh, create a context around all of these discussions. Um, first of all, we, uh, between Jeff and me, we have um, interviewed Marsha. Uh, we've now, I, I met with Melanie, Jeff was tied up and she had a very short window of time. So I went ahead with a meeting. Uh, met with Delia and um, Alan twice. So we've, I think we've got very solid information from the town and where people think, where, where they all think it's feasible to do something. Um, at the same time, uh, Jeff has talked with the folks who run the state program where they're testing alternate systems. Um, and he has a very good technical background, so it's logical for him to do that. Uh, so I think, um, where we are today is um, 
you know, I was kind of jotting down some notes. I, mean, I think our goal is obviously we want to uh, remove and, and or neutralize the nutrients in the pond. So how do we do that? So um, short term is um, how do we stop what's going on now? Stop the degradation. Doesn't mean we're improving the water at the same time, but we're, we're stopping it from uh, getting worse. And I think... Um, there are several steps that we can take and all the sum total of those would be hopefully to say, okay, it's hit bottom. Now we'll take the next steps. Um, and so some of those, I mean, they're not all that dramatic. One is obviously uh, let's keep the rainbow trout out of the pond. Another one is um, can we put a program together where we get people to pump their systems frequently? So it's not eliminating necessarily uh, the fact that nitrogen and phosphorus can leach into the groundwater. It's just reducing the quantities of what's sitting in the leach fields or the leach pits. Um, so you, depending upon how successful it is and how many people sign up, um, it could greatly reduce the discharge amount, which should help. Um, you can know, I, can well, I interrupt for a minute? Sorry, Jim. Yeah. I mean, we, we, yeah, we've talked about a lot of these things. I didn't know if it you know, because Ellen said, because we've talked about a mid nauseum actually, and Ellen was saying, do a feasibility plan. So would that be part of the feasibility plan? These steps that you're talking about and we put them down in paper and see who would contribute? Yeah, or I, I would say so. I mean, to me is, and Jeff feels the same way, uh, we have, a, it's an urgent situation. So all of the things that we can do um, that uh, no one thing is going to be dramatic, but this Hey, Jeff, uh, the sum total of them um, can help stop the uh, degradation. So could, um, is that something you and Jeff can work on and put on paper and present to us next month? What this, the steps towards it the, and this it would be the beginning of the feasibility plan. Yeah. Right. Because um, it's us, I, the town, the residents. Yeah, I well, we've, gone, we've gone through all this. I don't I think we're beyond this. I mean, I think we've sort of no. itemized it was in our vision statement. I think that's all been done. I mean, that's I, what I'm I, saying it's a feasibility plan. If we want something to be done, it has to be put in paper and presented. Right. Mm -hmm. We can't just talk about it anymore. Is I think my point. Well, but it's we, been in the vision statement. Every I mean, has, isn't all of this in our vision statement? I think it is. Right. Well, it's not a management we, plan. we need it, a management plan for the septics. For our septic system, like what are we going to do? We have, you know, maybe 60, 70 septics within 200 feet of the pond. What's, you know, what do other ponds do? What, what do people do to, to minimize the impact of this? If we're not going to do a sewer system or at least until a sewer system, what can we do in the meantime to right, minimize so the impact? So rather than that, I think Cheryl may be uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what we're asking for. If it sounds like you have a list or you've started one, I know you yeah. had a new discussion with Melanie, if she had anything to add, could you two put something together and we can present it at our next meeting with all yeah. those yeah. things outlined? Yeah, well, we can I do that. Yeah. that. I've already started, so Jeff, we can get together. And yeah, we'll do that. Up, but I just... okay. Yeah, then, the point I'm going to do a bunch more. I'm going to talk to a bunch of different towns and we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. Okay. Uh, and I, I'll point out that we, that the, the NRC has a brochure that was presented um, that talks about a lot of stuff, people not using pesticides, herbicides or fertilizers, um, which they issued in conjunction with the research done later, which we talked about sending out to homeowners we got the brochures, Beth, you picked them up. I asked the NRC to give them to us. Um, a lot of that's all, you know, sort of in there. So that's a brochure that we can look at and we can talk about parents. A lot of this information's already in there, um, just so you know. And I think that um, um, DLE was gonna put it online because right now you can't present it because it goes upside down and which way and up. And she talked about doing that. Um, Again, in the town, he's also planting and fertilizing that big, not only the re conservation land, but also the town land right now. They just were spreading some sort of liquid, whether it's fertilizer, pesticides, herbicides, who knows. Um, but a lot of that information has already been put in a brochure by the NRC. So are you planning on distributing that, Cheryl? I gave you those. Well, I'm not. I mean, the original thing was I was asked to do was to ask, uh, was ask Delia for to get copies as a 
Yeah. Right. And I, you picked them up because our office is never is closed. Most of the, you know, it's not open for people who have nine to five jobs or seven to five jobs. Um, so you pick them up. I'm not going to fold 150 of them by myself and distribute them. No. <laughs> but what were you thinking was going to happen with those? I wasn't doing gonna... anything. This was a committee asked me to call her and ask for them. I don't know. I wasn't okay. thinking anything. I was okay. directed as so, an action item. All right. So Jim and Jeff, thanks. Jim thanks. Jim and Jeff. That things. was one thing we can put in the plan. We can distribute those, you know. I don't think yeah, the we'll youth group's down. interested yeah. in doing Those that. Those are all things thing. that will help, but by themselves, they aren't going to really do yeah. too much. So some of the other things we're talking about is um, we have, we think, three systems discharging gray water into the pond. There may be more. Um, what can we do about that? Uh, and there, there's a reluctance to enforce anything. Um, so. One of my thoughts is, as we put this final plan together or the next iteration is in parallel with the technical kinds of stuff we're talking about, there needs to be legal review working in parallel. So when we come up with a solution, we know whether it can be enforced properly. Um, did, did you mention that to Melanie, Jim, about whatever you think are the three suspect systems or can you highlight yeah, we what the about, discussion was? Yeah. And, um, no solution. Um, okay. So that's, you know, there's that kind of thing. Um, there's also, I mean, I know this has been um, put off. It's the idea of treating the pond with aloe, which has been found to be very successful with uh, eliminating most of the phosphorus in the pond. It doesn't touch the nitrogen, but I I haven't had a chance to talk to Jeff about this, but there's some recent studies that say get rid of the uh, phosphorus and the nitrogen is not really the problem. Um, you may have a different um, view, Jeff, but that um, to me is being put off until we solve all the problems. Like, okay, discharge of septic and everything. Well, that's gonna be, uh, if we come up with an alternate alternative type of septic system, it's gonna be a while before that gets done. And there are gonna be several people who say, I'm not spending money on that. Well, what can we do about that? Other than plead with them to be good neighbors and protect the value of their homes, but that still isn't gonna work with everybody. So in the meantime, alum is a treatment that can be done. Um, it's, it's been very successfully used elsewhere. It's not cheap which is I think one of the reasons why Josh wanted to put a hold on the project until we could deal with the water quality. But so, Alan, I'm gonna interrupt again. I mean, we had to write a CPC proposal, which finally the town recognized how important this was. That's how we got the APOD in here and water quality testing. That's $30,000. Yeah. Alum is like three times that. It's right. and we. It's also environmentally. Um, it's an environmentally sensitive issue, and Ellen doesn't is going to be doing the same thing the APOD does, except it will have another effect on the ecosystem. So yeah. I don't well, think there isn't, there isn't much science that says it's harmful to the ecosystem. Um, Nancy Keely is opposed to it. I know she feels it's got big concerns. Um, so we can talk I, about it more like you know two, between the two of us I, i've heard a lot of mixed reviews about the alum yeah i mean but we're doing something right now alum is this, if the apod doesn't work maybe that's a discussion but it's still the prevention right we're trying to get the pond to some neutral level which is what the apod's intent is and then from there all these other things that we've all talked about right and that's why the feasibility plan would be so important for long term yeah, yeah. Well, I, so I why don't we just gonna... say, why don't we just say if you guys, and I'm, if we have to talk to Melanie again, or we can invite her to our next meeting, but so as we don't have to repeat ourselves again on the septic discussion, if you two could like put a bullet list or, you know, the top 10 yeah. things we can do and we can start forming, you know, what, what can we do? Like just those yeah. brochures, we, we can pass them out. Um, you know, Susan Bates talked about betterments that would be available, but you know, that's people's money too. The town, you know, doesn't have an unlimited budget either. So we have, I think it's up to us to try to put this plan together and then start, you yeah. know, seeing if we can get donations or things to help to make it happen. So we go on two branches at that point. One, looking at where does the money come from and what legally can be done to have the maximum impact. Right. 
Um, and the other one is continuing to come up with a solution short term and long term. Yeah. Um, some will be controversial, but, uh, you know, the risk is we lose the pond. Yeah. And after that fantastic gift, you really hate to see that happen because what a resource for the town. Now. Yep. All right. Cheryl, do you, that kind of clear for the minutes? Yep. We're going to put a list together of what can be done based on cost and effectiveness, long term and short term. There you go. Great. Thank you, everybody. Sorry, don't want to cut you off. I just want to I think we agreed feasibility would be the way to go. Um, other business is just the general catch all. Oh, no, I've skipped one. Sorry. Katie Blair and David Berg aren't on the call, which is unusual, but we wanted to give an official recognition to them both for all their uh, work. Friends of White Pond being on the committees, um, environmentally trying to make sure, you know, that everything, the testing and, and so forth. So um, this is just public acknowledgement from our White Pond Advisory Committee to thank them. What if we had, um, you know, a letter of, I don't know whether it's commendation or whatever you call it, coming from you and Josh and the select board? Just I think from our committee for sure to too. Service. I mean, yeah, all of you. Yeah. yeah. Mary, yeah. do you know if the town has anything they do, like, you know, thank you kind of note or letterhead? Um, I'm not aware of it. I could look into it. It's, um, I have never seen it happen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can start a new trend. Um, I am happy to put a letter together and like sign it, uh, send it to all you guys to sign or something. Okay. I think it would be more appropriate to come from the White Pond Advisory Committee then yeah. select board. Yep. Okay, so I move, I move that the committee um, create a letter and officially recognizing and outlining for those people who don't know. So there's a lot of new people here who don't realize how much time, how long um, they've been working on this. And um, and I think that we should include that in the letter. So I, rec I move that we draft a letter along those lines. Um, and, and have it signed. Second. I'll start the, I'll, thank you. I'll start the letter and I'll send it to you, um, Jim and, and Cheryl for sure, because you've been here a lot longer than me, probably know some of the other things that were being done. You know, I have uh, Jim Lyon, who used to be on the committee and is a neighbor of mine, gave me a couple of posters. They're beautiful, White Pond. But since they're moving and downsizing, I just don't feel like it's appropriate to give them something big like that because it's just maybe more of a hassle, but I thought that would have been nice. Maybe I can make it into like a postcard or something like that. Well, and also right. if we send it out, then people will maybe stop and thank them personally as well. I mean, the more, you know. Yeah. Well, true. there is a, um, Good. Uh, yeah. Jane Prentice is hosting a party for them coming up, kind of an open house thank you thing. Right. I guess it's right. going to be a barbecue. I'm not sure of the details. You can give them the letter then. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, just to acknowledge though, a lot of work, you know, going out on that rowboat, taking samples every week, oh, not, not always uh, ideal weather conditions. Um, okay, so the next line is other business. I know that we have Mary here was going to say a few words, ask some questions. Great, thank you, Beth. Um, hi everyone, I'm Mary Hartman. I live at 16 Concord Green, Unit 6 in West Concord. I am the newly elected member of the select board and I've been appointed the liaison to the White Pond Advisory Committee. Um, I'd like to just say a few things so that you can get to know me and also, um, but I should preface this with any opinions that I say here are not necessarily the opinions of the select board. I'm speaking on my own behalf. Um, I should start by saying that before I got on the select board, I was on the finance committee and the finance committee took a really strong interest in the acquisition of White Pond specifically around how much money the town was gonna to spend because when the town voted to accept it, we agreed that we would spend about 1.6 million. And you might know that it's gone up closer to 2 million. So I think, the, I, th I think I'd like to take some credit from the finance committee as far as making sure that some of the original ideas that were presented around recreational facilities were scaled back. Things like barbecue pits, things like pavilions, things like memorials. So a lot of that was scaled back because of the finance committees and our, our obviously our interest was keeping this within budget. 
Um, so I can, we, we kind of had the same goals only for different reasons. Um, I also, so other than that, I've uh, read your vision statement that you published in 2021. Um, and I thought it was great. I thought it did a great job of giving a sense of urgency and it was very focused as far as the water quality. Um, I've watched a lot of your meetings. I've talked to a lot of people, a lot of former select board members. Um, I've talked to a lot of people in town staff. So I really feel like I'm more up to speed than just a newbie coming in here. I obviously have things to learn, but I've done a lot of prep. Um, I'd really like to work with you to help to make this um, committee effective. And to do that, I think there might be some changes that need to be made, but I'm gonna wait and watch for a while and then possibly recommend um, some changes, especially around the charge that was um, put together by the select board way back in the 70s, was modified slightly in 2018. But given that the town has taken ownership of the beach, I think that might be a triggering event where the charge should be um, revisited. Um, other than that, I can um, answer any questions that you have, but I'm here to listen. And um, I would just like to caution you as far as, I'm really delighted to hear that you're thinking about the sewage problem, because when I read your vision statement and I saw the list of problems, the sewage, the stormwater, the fertilizer, the people management, all these problems, to me, sewage seemed to be the biggest problem. And I'm so glad to see that you're oh, working yeah. on that. Um, I wanna make caution you though, that you've got to be careful about who's gonna pay for that. Okay, so yeah. I, I heard you say that you're gonna think about that. So I know that Alan was very clear that this is a betterment that is paid for by the community and that the town can do something around um, low interest loans or right. not low interest loans, but loans that have the full weight of the town behind it. So the interest rate will be lower than a homeowner loan or a homeowner's yeah. association loan, but still, the debt service on those loans are paid for by the neighborhood. So I just wanted to make that clear. Anyway, so that's my, I'm here to learn. I'm here to help. I'll, I got two action items already, so I'm good to go. Um, I have a question. Those out, right? I'm Mira, sorry? You, sorry, I had a question. You mentioned that in, the, in 2000, I don't know when you said there was two changes to the committee's role, you know, what our role was. And now due to the acquisition of the beach property, right. you know, it might be a good time to change it. How, what did it, what was the first and second change? I mean, how did the second one change from the first? I don't know. I know all I know, all I could find was the new charge, which was done in 2018. And that was before the town had actually taken possession of the beach, the beachfront. And the original one was, I think, in 2000, it was in, 19, in the 70s or something. So that was really old. And I couldn't get my hands on that. So I can't answer. Good question. I can't answer it. So, but the charge that you're talking about now that was 2018 was the purpose of the committee and what we're supposed to do, which are, you know, feeling protect the pond, blah, blah, you know. Okay, great. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, so. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, it's Mario Piasecki. And one comment. Um, yeah, and your address, Maria, please. Oh, sorry, 28 Shore Drive in Concord. Thank and, you. Um, the, going back to when you were talking about the alum, um, I remember that I believe that the um, Delia mentioned that she would approach using alum only after the white pond improvements were done. So that first one has to deal with the surface runoff that's now been done on, on the town land. And after that's been done, would she revisit and study using alum in the pond to deal with the phosphorus? I thought I'd mention that. Just survive. Okay, thank you. Thanks. That's all. That's all. Okay. okay. Any other uh, questions for Mary or comments? Okay, thank you, Mary. Um, the next, uh, I don't know, Donna, you're here. Uh, would you like to say anything or ask questions or tell us who you are? Sorry, Don you're on mute still, Donna. I knew that. Um, 
I was just talking to Tess and uh, we don't really have a question. Oh, you kind of answered all our, uh, what we were thinking um, about the cleanliness um, and just what you guys, what you people might think you're gonna be doing and the cost and it was very interesting. I think we really learned a lot and I think Tess can hear me and if she has anything to ask, you can ask her right now, but I think we are all set. Okay. It was awesome. So, so um, Donna's from the middle school and her and Tessa t are attending. And I can also let you know, Donna, that there is a group, we are calling it the White Pond Youth Conservation Group that had been involved. Um, at one point they were actually trying to get, they're in the high school, we're going to see if they could get some of their, you know, extracurricular credits for doing some things. Really? They helped. Yeah, and they helped, they did so a lot of legwork with um, going into the Board of Health and getting data on all the septic and sewer information. So they did it by all the houses that abut the pond mm -hmm. and to figure out when the, the last, uh, you know, the septic, whatever septic service had been done, et cetera, et cetera. So when Jim Ricker kind of mentioned that there's maybe some problem houses, it's actually from that data. So it was a lot of work and they, they did a sense. great job. Yeah. Yeah, and they awesome. also, they also worked. Um, so it might be if, if you're, you know, if school wants to get involved, we can, we, we'd certainly welcome any help we could get, like even just talking about letting people be educated about the use of fertilizers and, and those things. We, we welcome the youth to uh, contribute as much as possible. Perfect. What do you think, Tess? Wait, is this like a, what is this like a th thing to get involved sort of <laughs> we, i kind of got have, lost it's okay tess we have a bunch you know we're all volunteers right yeah. and we have a, a youth group that's not part of white pond they're just a they we, one time we thought they'd be a subgroup but we have different subgroups for instance the septic and sewer is a subgroup that's what jim and jeff were spearheading i'm in a subgroup with katie blair suzanne langbridge about the water quality um testing uh, Josh was involved with a subgroup with Mary Beth Barker and Laura Wilson about people management. So we tried to take all, all the problem areas or potential problem areas, no matter how small or big, and get people focused on solutions for those. And the White Pond Youth Group was doing some of that data digging. In fact, they did some of the water sampling testing and they, did a, they started looking at roads too, because one thing we didn't mention tonight is that the roads and the disrepair in many of the roads that abut the pond also are contributors to yes. um, runoff, bad runoff as a matter of fact, because they're deteriorating, they're yeah. not you know leveled right and mm -hmm. things like that. So that's that's kind of the highlight of what we we're saying. And they cool. and they and they work together to decide what they want to do. They make decisions on their own. Um, they also um, transplanted some um, low bush blueberries from areas that were going to be impacted by the development, move them. Um, so they pick and choose what projects as a group they're interested in. And, and I think there's even some, you know, sub interests within there because some are more interested in um, protecting some of native plants and um, some are more interested sort of more of the statistical uh, data collection on like on the septic systems. So it's, um, you know, they all share what they're interested in and then they decide as a group what they want to spend their time doing. So yep. there's like, a, youth group to get involved with basically there there is and yeah. they're in high school but what i was trying to say is if you and classmates wanted to start a group from the middle school uh it, you could do the same kind of thing or you could join forces because it's you know it, it, it's it's just so important if it, the environment yeah. is so important so that's all i'm saying I, if i were a biology teacher i would say this is kind of a natural laboratory over here yeah that too. Over here. <laughs> so in any case, you're welcome to attend our meetings. And if there's something that's a particular of interest to you that you think should be something that is, we should be concerned about or that you'd like to help with or learn, you're always welcome. Thank you. Very yeah. good. Mary? Can I ask two questions actually? Number one, can you tell me who are the members? Because when I go onto the website, I can't find out who are the members of your committee. And um, go, go ahead. You mean the youth group or our committee? No, your committee. 
So if you go to the White Pond Advisory Committee, if you just Google that, it shows us. It shows. Yeah, but I'm, I want I want I want to know what they are on the town's website as a town committee. So I I want to make sure that I get the town website to show them accurately. So the town website shows our names accurately now. Uh, I, does it? I thought yeah. I'm not on there. Sure, I don't think Cheryl's on there. The town clerk, and she's she's going to get it fixed. Yeah, yeah, we've a... asked that three times, but I mean, I know I know okay. it's Cheryl, um, Josh, myself, and we've asked yeah. for Jim. It's not in, you know, there's two different sp spots when you look up things. There's, if you just say White Pond Advisory Committee, one page comes up. So maybe you can find it there. You mean if you Google it? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I, what I'd like to do is I'd like to make sure that, given that you're a town committee, that we follow the protocols for all town committees and have the information on the town website accurate for you. So yeah. I, can, I can look into that as well. So you've got five people. It's Josh, Beth, Cheryl, Jeff, and Jim. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And I can do a cut and paste. I'll send it to you later, Mary, so you can see what part I'm talking about, just so you see what's there now. That's okay. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna use the town website again. Hey, what is this from the town website? That's what I'm talking about. Okay. It's, well, that's not up to date. <laughs> we're, we're, it's, it's not. The town website, if I go into the Concord Mass website, I don't think I see who's on here now. Yeah, I'm going to send you a cut and paste of what I see. So you just, maybe we're looking in two different spots. But yes, okay, go ahead. Um, and the other one is um, the, the roads you were talking about as far as the runoff into the, 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 these are private roads, is that correct? That's yeah. correct. Okay, just wanted to check. Yeah. Which I isn't... think um, Mark was talking about um, was that the, there was a lot of concern about the runoff down from the state road. And that's something that the town has been looking at for years and years and years. Um, and Delia has and everybody has. And when with along with the purchase of the beach, um, the runoff from that road was dealt with as part of the, um, you know, build out of the beach. And I think that's what Maria was talking about when um, that, was big, that was the biggest area of runoff concern. That's where most of the testing came out with high. Um, no, 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 no. The testing came out all negative on the road. All negative. Is that where the new stormwater management system that we're spending? Yes, uh, that's where the storm yeah, management that's, that's system. That's is. what that is going to correct. Is no, that? Well, it's. Yes, that's what. I did quite a bit of testing on that road, and there was, I never had any positive tests for. But e. that's not fecal matter. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about phos phosphates and nitrates. No, I don't think there was system. any testing ever done on that road besides me. Not on the water. Not what on the road. In the water. Coming in the, the water of the water pond. Okay. Yeah, okay. In the water of the pond, they had high levels of phosphorus. And they, and they, decide, and they without, any, without any reason whatsoever, they just decided it was coming from down that road. And that's just incredible conjecture. Because it's obviously coming from the septic systems, but they just decided, oh, it's coming from Steve Barrel and the field, and that was no, huge. no, I don't think they did. I don't think they, they decided did. from Jim Barrel. I've, I've talked so to everybody Jim involved in the, in the thing, but it, regardless, and that's what they—that's what she's referring to—is that runoff? Is that is what she's referring to? But that runoff. That's all I'm saying. That's uh, I'm not yeah, okay. going to go any it's, further. That, that water coming down that road is rainwater, and everything I tested it extensively, and it's it's quite clean. And you know that's so whatever. They put a drain uh, a filter system in. See yeah. What happened? But, but so that's there. That's there now. And then um, Mary, just so for clarification, when the again the youth group kind of walked around some of the roads. For example, the street here here near me, White Ave. There's and there's and Dover area that other the other neighborhood yeah there's sewers and we looked at them and decided well first of all they need to be drained and taken care of and for example two sewers on White Avenue were just like pits dug they weren't doing anything right they just go and then water was accumulating when there was lots of water and because of the slopes it can actually you know fall into the pond so you know it's road matter it's oil from cars things like right. that right so that was kind of what i was talking about from that area and that was when i think you were at the meeting when alan was saying that's another you know and he had his assistant there about roads and that's a big project for the town in general but i mean it's a dilemma because these are private roads and personally i can tell you that even when uh, jane prentice was 
collecting money from the Dover Street area. I tried collecting it from the White Ave. Um, we see we never got Seymour or Tracy, you know, to do anything because there's another street that abuts, and these are all up on bluffs, right? So water's going to go one way or the other, and it's usually down towards the pond if the road isn't leveled correctly. So what impact that has? It, it's it's an impact. We just don't know how how much how severe. Okay, that makes so, sense. Yeah. yeah. But they are private roads is what I wanted to. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And that was one of the questions somebody asked me after our last meeting. Is there a way to have a private road become a public road? I I don't know. I, I think I'd have to ask well, Ellen Kafka how that even happens. I think that's a big process. Yeah, that's, is it? Yeah, yeah, that's hard. That's hard. There are, yeah, that would be, that would be a slippery road. slope because there's a lot of private roads in town. Are and, there? Yeah. Well, not a lot. I shouldn't say a lot, but there are private, like I live in a condominium community. We have private roads, you know, it would just like, and we have um, rivers going through here. So it would be similar to us saying, please take over our roads. Yeah, it's not going to happen. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Yeah. I, I, I think, think there private are roads still have to follow stormwater management plans. Is my understanding. I'm sorry. I think private roads still have to follow the stormwater the state management plan guidelines. I mean, well, I think you're not allowed to have uh, stormwater flowing from your property into the pond. It has to be managed. Like when you have a construction site, obviously you have to do it. But I think, I think you, you know, you, I don't know what the law is, but I'll maybe I'll look into that. That would be a good thing to find out what the obligations are for private road owners regarding runoff. Yeah, I mean, it's probably like another rabbit hole with the sewers, right? Because some people will do something and some people won't. I mean, it's again, it comes not to desire necessarily, but it's money. And these are expensive, you know, putting a road in, for example, somebody quoted one part, just a small part was like, you know, $40,000 and we couldn't even get people to contribute to cleaning up the sewers. So it's a big yeah. deal. Yeah. We had more luck on this side when Jane put that sewer cleaning program, storm drain cleaning. Yeah, um, yeah, you did. There were enough donations, donation, enough donations to more than cover the cost. Just, and yes. people who weren't near the drains, I mean, just, hey, we need to do it for our neighborhood. And Yeah, and it could be because, and that was great. And it might be because you have an association. Yeah, oh yeah, no question. It, Right, and it's easier to reach people, but the Seymour Tracy side does not. I can tell you, White Ave Mitchell does not. So, and some people are not even here all all the time. So, it, it's complicated. Yeah, um, yeah, it is. Okay, other business or comments from attendees or uh, committee members. Well, I have one comment. Um, and I don't mean it to be negative, but it's the rubber meets the road here and we start getting closer and closer to having to make decisions and where to spend money and how hard to enforce them. I would like to think that um, collectively, we sort of view ourselves as a watershed association. So it'll be the various town, depart town departments, us, the neighborhood groups and so forth. So that decisions aren't made in a vacuum by say one person because there may be, particularly if it's a scientific decision or a technical decision, there may be offsetting information and we may not be doing something that we could safely do or vice versa. We may, you know, all push for something and it doesn't make sense, um, I can, you know, ecologically. So just, uh, I don't think there's any way to formally structure it, but thinking more on a consensus basis by all the so-called, you know, shareholders in the whole, whole endeavor. You mean the various different town departments? Can I, can you clarify? Well, the for town me? departments and the neighborhoods, neighborhood oh. associations. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I yeah. think that's the model for some of the watershed associations and other communities, but we're already pretty well set up that way, I think. Um, but there's a lot of knowledge around the table and I think when it comes to key decisions, um, not that anything's going to be overridden, but you know, take advantage of that. Just food for thought. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Uh, this is 
Van Langridge, 77 Bolton Street. And she's and I'm also at my daughter's soccer game, so I'm a little bit um, here. Yeah, you're cutting in and out. Cheryl, it's Suzanne Langridge, Bolton Street. Go ahead, Susan. And I'll ask this first, but uh, there's two things to bring in is the the down I am bad as there's no. I'm from the. I don't know if this is just. Uh, uh, the water. Suzanne, uh, Suzanne, we really can't, can't get. Suzanne, can you hear me? Uh, you're, you're cutting out terribly. We can't really understand anything. Oh. Can, can you move to a okay. different area? I. I don't even see. I think she's on mute. No, I'm not seeing her. So. I guess um, <laughs> yeah. I, is it only me or can you guys can you guys hear? I can hear. Sounds like she's trying. I'm sorry, my doctor is terrible. No, not working. <laughs> <laughs> we can't hear you. Okay. Suzanne, uh, one more time. <laughs> okay. We know you're at a soccer game, anything? but you're in a bad cell zone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any feedback? <laughs> no. Okay. Suzanne, if you want to send me an email. All right. <laughs> and of course, uh, we can okay. have you come at the next meeting. I'm sorry. Yeah, we're gonna have to, it's it's not, yeah, sorry about that. Just send me an email and we can add it to the next agenda. Unless it's something time consuming, just let me know and we can see what we can do. We have to have a second meeting in um, June. Thank you so much. Um, okay, thank you. That was the clearest you were. <laughs> um, is there any, and, and anybody else there, uh, can I vote to? Adjourn the meeting. Second. Um, I think I need to leave for dinner now, so um, I'm gonna go. Okay. okay thank, thank you for you. having me. Thanks for coming. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Cute. All right, guys. So I think we had a second. Thank you, everybody. Um, our next meeting is scheduled for June 22nd at 7 p.m. It will be Zoom. Uh, it's unclear in July if we're going to have to go to live meetings. We're waiting for the state to uh, make a recommendation on that. But June 22nd at 7 p.m. is the next planned meeting. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.